I'm speaking to you at this year's online BSD CAN 2022 about speeding up the FreeBSD boot process. But before I start that, I want to go back four years to BSD CAN 2018 in the pre-pandemic days when we all met up in Ottawa, where I gave a talk about profiling the FreeBSD kernel boot. Uh, that is from Hammer Time, which is the AMD64 architecture-specific entry point to the kernel, to start in it, which is when the user land portion of the boot process starts. I'm hoping that since this talk is effectively a continuation of that talk from four years ago, uh, there will be a, a YouTube link somewhere so you can watch the first portion of this talk if you're interested in seeing the background to the work I did four years ago. So today I'm talking about speeding up the FreeBSD boot process uh, from EFI main, which is to say the entry to the bootloader, uh, to the end of Etsy RC, which is to say the, the user land portion of the, boot, of the boot process. Previously on speeding up the FreeBSD boot, and of course, if you want all the details, go and watch my talk from four years ago, but I'll just give a brief overview here. In 2017, I added the TSLog framework to the FreeBSD kernel. This is essentially a set of macros which compile away to absolutely nothing unless you set options TSLog in the kernel configuration. So without options TSLog, there's no impact on the FreeBSD performance uh, from all this profiling that I added. But if you want to profile a kernel, then you add options TSLog and it will record lots of information for you. Uh, this works mostly by having two macros, TS enter and TS exit, uh, which as the name suggests, uh, you use to mark the entry point and the exit point from functions. Uh, they record the timestamp and also the name of the function being called. And these are purely C macros, so there's no magic with the compiler to you know, automatically insert entry and exit code for functions. Uh, you just any function you care about, you insert these macros uh, at all of the, well, the entry point and then all the exit points from the function. So if there's several points you can return from, you need to add TS exit at each of those. Uh, using these macros, I instrumented some of the useful parts of the kernel boot process. Uh, hammer time, I mentioned before, when we first start booting the kernel. Uh, MI startup, which is the machine independent startup routines, which is most of the kernel boot process. And then start init, which is when we move into the user land portion of the boot. Uh, I instrumented the delay routine because, well, if we're spending time just spinning our wheels, uh, waiting a certain amount of time, that's something we want to know about. Uh, vprintf, which is the routine that prints anything to the console. Uh, I noticed quite a bit of time was being spent printing data to the console, so I wanted to see how much that was. Uh, I instrumented all of the sysinit routines. Um, most of the FreeBSD boot process is these sysinits. Uh, uh, sysinit is a way for any file in the kernel to declare, uh, here's a function that I want to have run at a certain point in the boot process. And sysinit is in fact a macro. So it was easy for me to add TS enter and TS exit into that macro uh, so that with just a few lines of code added there, uh, suddenly all of the different sysinits in, in the FreeBSD kernel were being uh, instrumented like this. Similarly, device probe and device attach routines for probing the hardware and then attaching the right driver. Um, there are many of those in the kernel, but fortunately they, we declare them with macros, so it was easy for me to uh, slip TS enter and TS exit into there. Uh, again, a few, small number of lines of code uh, allowed me to instrument a very large portion of the kernel boot. Uh, and then VFS mount is the routine that mounts a new file system. Again, I wanted to, to be able to see if a lot of time was being spent mounting file systems. This allowed me to generate flame charts of the FreeBSD kernel boot process. And here you see 11.0 um, release, uh, what it looks like uh, throughout that kernel boot process. So uh, all of the, I should explain all of the blue blobs you can see are delay calls. The green is printing to the console. Um, and if you look very closely, uh, maybe zooming in on the video, uh, you will see the names of all the functions in here as well. And thanks to this work on profiling a kernel, uh, it was then possible to start speeding up part of the, the kernel boot process. Uh, 
Uh, I noticed that a significant amount of time was being spent on VM page initialization. I mentioned this to some of the uh, VM gurus. I was not going to be touching the VM code myself, but uh, a couple days later, a patch came back, which uh, essentially cut the, the time in th by a factor of three being spent on VM page initialization. Turns out that we were uh, looping through all of the uh, page structures three times, initializing different parts of the structures each time. Uh, it's a lot faster just to go through once and initialize everything all at once. Uh, I noticed that the HPT uh, drivers were spending a long time in their probe routines. Uh, turns out this was a bug in those drivers. They were doing things in the probe that should have been in the attach routine. Um, a couple of weeks later, they came back to us with a new driver that uh, cut out 330 milliseconds there. Uh, every time a new uh, CPU was, was being uh, attached to the system uh, during the boot process, it would announce its presence on the system, that it was now up and running, uh, and this simply by virtue of, of writing to the, the console and having everything scroll upwards on the console, uh, was spending about 40 milliseconds for each CPU that was launching in the system, which if you have a lot of CPUs, it, it adds up, of course. Um, we changed this to simply have all of the CPUs on one line just printing out their number rather than a, a full line uh, saying CPU number, whatever, launched. Uh, and this saves about 40 milliseconds for each CPU. Uh, optimizing writes to the VGA text console saved uh, about 1.3 seconds. Um, turns out rather than writing two 8-bit uh, bytes at a time, you can perform a single 16-bit write uh, and takes half of the time. Um, I noticed that a lot of the time was being spent scrolling the screen where most of the right, right hand side of the screen was just blanks. And we were actually wasting a lot of time overwriting blanks with blanks. So I added code which kept track of what we had written to the screen most recently and didn't write again if it hadn't changed. And then one EC2 specific change I made, uh, I turned off the PS2 keyboard and mouse. They don't actually exist in EC2. So why are we spending a lot of time looking for them? And uh, in fact, why are we spending time resetting the hardware, which isn't really there? Uh, our routines for resetting the, the PS2 keyboard controller are very slow. Uh, I'll get into that a bit later. And then in uh, 2019 and 2020, not much happened. Uh, you know, life happens, a pandemic happened, and uh, I didn't really get much more done on this until March 2021. Uh, Julia Percival was born March 2021, and I discovered it is really hard to focus on writing code when you have a newborn baby in the house. Fortunately, you don't need to focus very much just to look at flame charts and slowly dig through code to track down where the time is going. You notice, gee, there's a lot of time being spent here. Maybe put a couple more lines of instrumentation into the kernel, build a new kernel, change a few diapers, come back and you have a new kernel, you can see a little bit further of, of where that time is going. And so I started what I started calling Project Julia, which is to say, speeding up the boot process uh, in between changing diapers. Now, I mentioned when I did this work four years ago, I was only looking at the FreeBSD kernel boot. One of the things I noticed while I was doing that was a lot of time was being spent, in fact, in the bootloader before we entered the kernel. Now that I was looking at look, uh, profiling the boot process more generally, I decided, well, I really need to go back and figure out what's going on in the bootloader. So I use more or less the same system for the bootloader as I used for the kernel. Um, I ha wrote new TS enter and TS exit macros, uh, because of course we can't use, we use the kernel code there, uh, which record timestamps when we enter and exit functions of interest. I allocated a two megabyte buffer uh, when we enter the, the bootloader, and I just write records into there one by one as, as we hit these macros. A note for anybody interested in uh, getting started with, with FreeBSD development, the bootloader is actually a wonderfully nice environment to work with. It's single-threaded. You don't need to worry about mutexes. You don't need to worry about multiple threads stomping all over each other. You just go ahead and do stuff. Uh, and in fact, 
from almost the very beginning of the bootloader, you even have malloc available, which you don't get in the kernel until you, you've, you've gone a long way through the uh, virtual memory initialization. So it was remarkably easy for me to add this instrumentation to the bootloader. At the end of the bootloader, uh, we take this buffer, which is as much as we filled out of this two megabytes that we allocated, and pass it into the kernel as a kernel module. Um, obviously, it's, it's not a kernel module in the sense of code which is being linked to, uh, but it's passed into the kernel the same way, and routines in the kernel can look up this module and then handle its data. And the debug.tslog syscatl, which is what I already used for dumping the uh, output of the kernel timestamp records, uh, I just say, well, if we've got this, this module from the bootloader, write out all that before we dump the kernel records. On the other side of the boot process, uh, after we launch in it, um, we spend some time in the userland portion of the boot process, and I wanted to profile this as well, of course. Uh, the userland tslog is actually implemented in the kernel, uh, so there's no changes at all to the userland itself. Uh, but in the kernel, for each process, again, only if you have options tslog enabled, uh, we record the timestamp of the fork and exit calls, which create and then destroy the process, the parent process ID, the first path, sorry, the last path passed to exec VE, uh, and it has to be the last one because a lot of times you're launching a daemon, but doing it through, through the limits utility. So you want to record the actual daemon's name, not just limits. Uh, and finally, the first path, which is resolved by name I, uh, which is generally speaking the, the first file that you open. The reason for this is that uh, Etsy RC, in fact, um, does not execute all the rc.d scripts, rather it uh, ingests them into the shell. So those files are being opened and read, but not executed. Um, we record all the processes launched in the system, but when we actually generate the frame charts at the end, we ignore anything that happens after Etsy RC finishes. So they're just a bunch of data that we, we toss out at the end. So this lets, let me generate flame charts of the entire boot process, starting from when we enter the, the loader to when we finish running Etsy RC. And it looks oddly like this. Uh, this is 11.1 release. Now I should point out here, 11.1 release did not have all this profiling code, uh, but I was able to take the patches I made to add this to FreeBSD 13 and uh, backport it all the way back to 11.1 uh, just so I could generate this flame chart. And that section in the middle um, looks rather like the flame chart I showed before. Of course, that section is the kernel boot process. So a bit over a third of the kernel of the entire boot process is that kernel boot that I was looking at four years ago. Now we can see the whole picture. Something you can't see on that flame chart is the time spent between when the CPU resets, when you turn on the system, and when we enter the bootloader. And the first thing I noticed when I started actually digging into where the time was going was we were spending three and a half seconds in the EC2 instances that I was using to, for my development work before we entered the bootloader. So I was scratching my head. I couldn't imagine why the BIOS itself would take that long. Then I realized we don't go directly into the bootloader when we're running from BIOS. Instead, in this case, we're running GPT boot instead because the EC2 instances use GPT partitioning. GPT boot has this wonderful code in place where if you press a key within the first three seconds after turning on the system, it will switch into interactive mode and then you can pick which disk you want to boot from. I suspect the vast majority of FreeBSD users have never used this mode. Uh, offhand, I don't even know what the syntax is for telling it which disk I want to boot from, but it is there if you press a key within three seconds. Of course, this means it waits three seconds to see if you press a key, including in EC2, where you don't even have a keyboard attached, so you can't press a key. Well, the fix for this is very simple. Uh, we put a flag into slash boot.config. The dash N flag says, do not switch into interactive mode if someone presses a key, which also means don't wait three seconds. So this sped up the boot process by three seconds. And you'll see a theme over the course of this talk a lot of the places we're spending time, the solution is just don't spend the time there. <laughs>
Now, speaking of BIOS, uh, on x86 systems, there's two ways we can boot. We can boot via the old BIOS, which dates back to the, the 1980s uh, IBM PC, or we can use UEFI, which is the sort of modern way of booting systems. We were using BIOS, um, traditional, supported everywhere, but there's some issues with that. Because it's running back with the, the 1980s technology, um, it's running in 16-bit mode for all the disk I.O. calls, which means it has to use a bounce buffer below the one megabyte barrier because that's all you can access within 16-bit mode. Well, we don't have a lot of memory below the one megabyte barrier, so the BIOS bootloader was only performing 16 kilobyte I.O.s at a time. Well, that's going to take longer if you're doing lots of 16 kilobyte I.O.s rather than 64 kilobyte or, or larger IOs. There's a second problem specific to EC2, which is that the VGA text mode is very, very slow. Um, the way they have it implemented, uh, you, you write to a location that looks like it's just memory, but it causes a trap, which then results in switching CPU modes and running code that actually draw, renders the glyph onto the screen it's very slow, around 60,000 clock cycles every time you touch the VJ text mode. So this, the solution here was to switch East 2 armies over to using UEFI. Um, this isn't going to work for people, this isn't going to help people outside of EC2, uh, but I suspect as a general rule, uh, people will find that their systems will boot faster with UEFI than using BIOS. This reduced the boot time by roughly five seconds in total. Uh, some of that was in the, the bio, in the bootloader, uh, and some of it was in the kernel because actually printing to the screen to the, uh, was faster uh, in UFI mode as well from the kernel. This does introduce one new problem, which is that older EC2 instance types don't support UFI booting. Uh, I don't think this is a very large problem because most people should not be using the older instance types anyway. Uh, the one case where it could matter is that uh, the bare metal EC2 instance types don't support UEFI at the moment. Uh, I've pointed this out to people at, at Amazon and uh, a few months back I was telling people I would really like, love to see a polyglot boot mode where you can mark an instance, as in fact I always do, uh, as supporting both BIOS and UEFI and uh, EC2 could select automatically which one to use. Obviously I, I don't know uh, what Amazon has planned in this direction, but the option is still there in the FreeBSD release building code. Uh, you can build images which boot using BIOS, and if anybody really needs one, just let me know and I can, I can build some images for you. Moving on, uh, the, the loader has a wonderful block cache, which it uses to cache data to read from disk. Uh, if you can avoid it, you don't want to read the same block from disk multiple times. Uh, if you don't have this block cache in place, uh, certain blocks like the disk partition table and the file system super block and the root directory will be read 50 times or more by the bootloader as it goes through looking for all the different files at once. Unfortunately, this block cache is freed every time the disk reference count drops to zero, which was happening after every time we read a file because the loader is single threaded and we only read one file at once. So we had a wonderful block cache that was supposed to speed things up, and in fact we were caching data and then throwing it away before we could ever use it again. So the first fix for this uh, was simply keep the root file system open. Once you find the root file system, open a handle to it, keep it open, and that way the disk reference count never drops down to zero. This shaves about 1.6 seconds off the boot process. There was still a, a few blocks being read multiple times uh, because it takes a while to actually find the root file system. Uh, there's a, a bit of tasting of disks that goes on looking for certain files. You know, if there's slash boot slash loader on a, on a file system, that's probably the one we, we want to boot from. So I actually changed the code a little bit later just to say, if we have a disk, a, a real disk, not like a, C, a CD, um, then just don't free the, that block cache at all. And that saved another 40 milliseconds off of the boot process. Again, this is in, in uh, Amazon EC2, where I did all of, almost all of my benchmarking. Speaking of disk I.O. from the bootloader, um, 
one of the things that the bootloader has done for many decades is printing twiddle characters, that is say a vertical line, a diagonal line, a horizontal line, then a, a different diagonal line, uh, so that users can, can see that something's actually happening while it, it's reading from disk and you don't think the system has just crashed. This code dates back, as I say, multiple decades, and the, the speed at which it twiddles in terms of the number of twiddles per megabyte of data being read hasn't been adjusted for 20 years. And when I benchmarked this in EC2, the loader was twiddling at about 1.6 kilohertz. Now, nobody has a screen that fast, never mind eyes that can see it twiddling that fast. So this was rather pointless. I reduced the speed of the loader twiddling by a factor of 16, and this shaved about 50 milliseconds off of the boot time. In EC2, it's still twiddling at 100 hertz, which is more than you need, but I figured, yeah, some people might have slow disks. Uh, if you have a, a, a disk which is 10 times as slow, it's still twiddling at, at 10 hertz, which is plenty for, for people to see uh, that, yes, there's something going on, the system hasn't crashed. Speaking of reading data from disk, um, while reading data from disk, the loader optimistically reads ahead, which it's a very good optimization. Uh, if you've got a large file uh, written all contiguously on disk, as the kernel usually is, um, you're probably going to want the next data, not just the data that you actually that the file system is asking for at this particular moment. The size of the read ahead is adjusted automatically based on whether recent reads could be satisfied with previously read ahead data. It starts at 32 kilobytes and if we find that the read ahead is useful, we increase it. If we find that the read ahead is not giving us anything useful, then we decrease it because why, why read extra data if we aren't likely to use it? With the UFS file system, most IOs from the loader are 32 kilobyte reads. Um, yeah, most IOs from the file system, that is, are 32 kilobyte reads. And with, if we have large contiguous files, like the reading the kernel from disk, Ideally, we'd like to perform much larger IOs. Uh, unfortunately, we did not, in fact, end up performing much larger IOs uh, because of something I refer to as silly read-ahead syndrome. The loader starts with 32 kilobyte read-aheads and a request will come in from the file system code saying, we want 32 kilobytes of this file. Uh, on a UFS file system, uh, at this point, you're dealing with 32 kilobyte blocks. So the file system asks for one block of data at a time. The loader says, okay, you want 32 kilobytes, I want a 32 kilobyte read ahead, I'll ask for 64 kilobytes of data. Okay, so it gets its data, passes it back up to the file system, file system comes down saying, I want the next block of data, give me 32 kilobytes more. Loader says, aha, I have this already, the, the, the read ahead worked, I will increase my read ahead length to 64 kilobytes. And it passes the data back. Then another request comes in from the file system, give me the next 32 kilobytes. And the loader then looks at what it's got and says, well, I don't have that yet. Clearly the read ahead hasn't been very useful. And so it shrinks its read ahead back down to 32 kilobytes. It issues an IO for 32 kilobytes of data plus 32 kilobytes of read ahead, which is to say 64 kilobytes. And this cycle repeats until the file has been completely read with a series of 64 kilobyte reads, even though the file was completely, completely contiguous on disk. So to solve this silly read-ahead syndrome, uh, I change the way that the read-ahead works. I track how much unconsumed read-ahead data we have. Uh, I increase the read-ahead length if the complete request can be satisfied, as before, or if the request consumes all the remaining read-ahead data. So if we have, say, 32 kilobytes of read-ahead data and we're asking for the next 64 kilobytes, then we say, well, the read ahead was clearly useful. It, it has data that we wanted. It just doesn't have all the data we wanted, but it's still useful. We're, we're read ahead, reading ahead in the right place. Um, on the, the flip side, decreasing the read ahead length, what we were doing is just saying, if we don't have all the data we want, then decrease the read ahead length. Uh, instead, I now say, only decrease the read ahead length if we have read ahead data and it wasn't useful. So if, we've, if we were reading ahead and then we've already used up all that read-ahead data, we shouldn't count that against the read-ahead. It, it did its job, it's just, it's finished its job. Now we're reading more data. So this decreased the boot time by 120 milliseconds, uh, and it meant that instead of the, the series of 64 kilobyte reads, we had much longer reads uh, up to the limit of the, uh, the read-ahead length in the, the bootloader. Uh, 
So this gave me a series of 128 kilobyte reader heads, um, which meant 32 kilobyte read requests plus 128 kilobyte reader heads uh, gave me 160 kilobyte, 160 kilobyte IOs. Uh, this was a lot better, of course, uh, but 160 kilobytes is not really a round number. Um, it's not as large as it could be. So I changed the code a little bit to say, uh, instead of a limit of 128 kilobyte on, kilobytes on read heads, allow the read heads to be up to 256 kilobytes minus the length of the read, which is to say, generate a maximum of 256 kilobyte reads at a time. And do, allowing this uh, meant effectively 30, 32 kilobyte reads plus 224 kilobyte read heads. 256 kilobyte read IOs uh, and the boot time was, was reduced by another 80 milliseconds. Moving into the kernel, uh, there's a wonderful erratum from Intel. Um, problem with the ACPI power management timer, it may return an improper result when read. Uh, there's a three nanosecond window every so often where the timer value being read is indeterminate. If you're running on a PIIX4 or PIIX4E chipset. Now, if this was, this was an in-person conference, I would be asking for a show of hands, does anybody out there have such a system? And then I would look around and say, well, clearly nobody is putting their hand up. Nobody has such a system. And there's a reason for this. This workaround for this Eratom uh, was added in 2002. It is an Eratom that only affects the Pentium 2 and Pentium 3 chipsets. Uh, if the system is detected to have this erratum, then we use the slower ACPI safe timer. If not, we use ACPI fast. And if you've been reading your kernel log messages, you will probably see ACPI fast. And some people I, I've noticed online have been asking, so what is this ACPI fast anyway? What's what's fast about it? Well, it's it's fast because it's it's not the slower ACPI safe timer. But to detect if we have this erratum, all we do is spend 140 milliseconds reading that timer over and over again and saying, are we seeing anything weird in the results from this timer? Are we seeing garbage coming back from it? Well, we don't really need to do that now. <laughs> this this was a, a, a workaround from 20 years ago, and I don't expect anybody has an affected system. So in FreeBSD 13, uh, this, this test is now disabled by default. And assuming that nobody reports any problems, which I, I very much doubt, uh, I will remove that test code entirely in 15 current next year. So this shaved 140 milliseconds off of the boot process. A couple issues with drivers. Uh, I noticed uh, four years ago that the ENA driver, that is the Elastic Network Adapter driver from Amazon, uh, in the process of uh, setting up a device, uh, there were eight times it would reset the device in various ways and wait 100 milliseconds after each of those. Um, so I emailed them and said, you know, this, we're spending 800 milliseconds here. Can you do anything about this? Uh, and they wrote back and said, yes, we will deal with it. Um, I don't actually know exactly how they dealt with it or when they dealt with it. But when I came back to this in 2021, uh, that 800 milliseconds was gone. So Thank you, Amazon. Thank you, Semi Half, which maintains the FreeBSD driver for the ENA, for the ENA device. Um, whoever did the work, uh, thank you for speeding that up by 800 milliseconds. Uh, another device here, the NVMe, the disk uh, device, um, in the process of attaching to disks, it was issuing reset commands and waiting uh, again 100 milliseconds after each of those. Uh, there were a few other places that it had small delays. Um, Warner put a lot of work into this. Um, thank you, Warner. I owe you several drinks. Uh, I can't explain all the changes that he made, but all these delays went away, uh, and this sped up the boot process by about 330 milliseconds per disk. If you have one disk attached, yeah, it, it's nice. Shave, shave off a, a third of a second. If you have, say, 24 disks attached, uh, that's eight seconds of boot time that just went away. So uh, a very, very nice improvement, thanks to Warner. Clock calibration. Uh, on x86 systems, there are two places that we spent an entire second calibrating clock frequencies. Uh, we use a very simple calibration algorithm. We read the clock, we wait a second, and then we read the clock again. And whatever the difference is, is the frequency of the clock in uh, you know, hertz, uh, in, in, in clock ticks per second. Uh, this change, uh, I actually 
spent the past five years on and off working on. Um, what we do now is instead of taking just two measurements at the start and the end of, of this one second period, we take repeated measurements of the clock we're calibrating and also the reference clock we're calibrating against. And we perform a statistical regression analysis to find the ratio of the frequencies of those two clocks. Uh, and then we also have uh, some code for figuring out how accurate our, our uh, calibration is so that we can stop when we're pretty sure we've calibrated to within one part per million. This, this was a significant amount of code, actually the, the most difficult of all the changes that I, I've made to speed up the boot process. Uh, but at the end of this, uh, the boot process, uh, boot time was reduced by 1,997 milliseconds, which is to say that what was two seconds is now three milliseconds for calibrating those two clocks. Moving into user land, the Etsy RCD uh, random script um, takes blobs of entropy that the system has stashed in slash entropy slash boot slash entropy and slash var slash db slash entropy uh, slash eight different file names in there. Um, we want to make sure that the kernel random number generator has enough entropy in it so that we can generate things like random port numbers and cryptographic keys securely. But when the system first boots, it hasn't had a chance to generate, uh, to collect much entropy from a timer skew and so on. So over the process of, of the system running, we, we stash bits of entropy every so often. And then when, when we boot up again, we ingest all of these. Um, Unfortunately, the random dev, that is the, the kernel device driver for dev random, um, had this interesting comment, uh, introduce an annoying delay to stop swamping. Uh, that annoying delay was 100 milliseconds every time we write to the device. It's not entirely clear to me why uh, we were had that 100 millisecond delay. Uh, I suspect that it was due to, given the comment about swamping, uh, I suspect it was due to an unfounded concern about uh, that a large amount of non-random input could somehow weaken the output of the random number generator. Um, past random number generators had this issue. Uh, if you go back to the way that we generated random numbers, say 20 or 30 years ago, that was absolutely an issue. Uh, but modern cryptographic random, random number generators, there's no issue there. You can feed as much non-random data into it as you want, and it will not weaken the, the cryptographic security of the random numbers, numbers generated. So the fix was very simple here. Uh, I took out the 100 millisecond delay and the boot time then sped up by 900 milliseconds. IPv6 router solicitation, uh, RFC 1970, now that number alone should tell you it's from some time ago, says that before a host sends an initial solicitation, it should delay for a random amount of time between zero and max RTR solicitation delay, which is say one second. This serves to alleviate congestion when many hosts start up on a link at the same time. Well, yes, theoretically. Um, in practice, if you've got gigabit or 10 gigabit networks, you would need to have hundreds of thousands of hosts starting up at the same time to cause any congestion from these tiny router solicitation packets going out. So we had code in our router solicitation uh, utility and daemon, which would wait a random amount of time between zero and one seconds before sending the router solicitation packet. Uh, the fix was simple. I turned it off by default. And this reduced boot time by well, a random amount of time between zero and one seconds, which is so an average of 500 milliseconds. IPv6 duplicate address detection. Uh, RFC 2462 says duplicate address detection must take place on all unicast addresses, etc., etc. The way this works is uh, when you configure an address on an interface, it starts out as a tentative address and it sends out a couple of packets saying basically, I, I think I am this this host, I, I think I have this address. Uh, does anybody out there want to contradict me? And it waits to see if another host replies saying, no, no, that's that's my address. I, I can see this is useful in general, uh, but for EC2, it's not useful. The, the way that EC2's network is configured, you can't get duplicate IPv6 addresses because they filter all of your traffic uh, going in and out of the instances. You, 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 you just cannot configure two different instances to use, to use the same address. So I just turned this off in the EC2 images and the boot time sped up by two seconds as a result.
So at the end of this uh, work, uh, which is all, all, everything I've talked about is in 13.1 release, um, I can now show you more flame graphs, uh, more, more flame charts. Uh, so at the top, you see the flame chart from the 11.1 release boot process, which is a bit over 28 seconds long. In the middle, you can see when FreeBSD first boots on uh, a EC2 C5 XLR, so it's the same instance type, uh, running 13.1 release. And that entire boot process is now about nine and a half seconds. You can see the, the bootloader at the left um, is significantly shrunk. Um, the kernel time is, is almost gone. It, it dropped from uh, about 10 seconds down to about one second. And then there's still a, a chunk, although a smaller chunk of time being spent in the user land portion of the boot process. Uh, interestingly, if you reboot a system, one of these instances, uh, it gets a lot faster. And at the bottom, you see the, the time, a flame chart of rebooting this same EC2 instance. Uh, the loader is faster at this point, I think, because the, the system has some of the, the disk already cached. Um, and then the use land portion of the boot process is also a bit faster. Um, and that's down to about four and a half seconds for booting up, for, for rebooting uh, this EC2 instance running 13.1 release. Now, there's more work to be done here. Um, if you look closely, I'll just go back a slide, um, there's two blue blobs left uh, in the use land portion of the boot process, which is say two seconds being spent just sleeping. Uh, and this is during IPv6 initialization. Um, the code used for IPv6 initialization uh, in user land, um, we, we call routines that start setting up the, the network and then we sleep and we just sort of trust that after a second of sleeping, things will have happened. This is not ideal. Um, it works, but of course it, it, we spend a, a second sleeping. Um, unfortunately, I don't know enough about IPv6 network set up uh, to fix this, but I'm hoping that uh, with help some, from some friends, uh, this will get resolved in the near future. Um, the first time a system boots on EC2 uh, running IPv4 DH client, it takes about two seconds. And I don't know why I need to dig into this to figure out what's going on. Um, when we reboot, uh, we get a response back almost immediately from the, the DHCP server. So it's something specific about the first time an EC2 instance is booting. Uh, that DHCP is weirdly slow. Something you don't see on these these flame charts uh, because th these are from EC2 uh, is that, but a lot of people run into it on laptops, is if you're booting from Z a ZFS root partition, um, you may find that the system waits for nine seconds uh, saying uh, waiting for US bus zero, which is say uh, waiting for the USB bus to be probed. Uh, if you're booting from URFS, then the system has code for saying, have we got the disk we want? Yes, we can mount the root file system. We'll just go ahead and do it, not wait for USB. Um, ZFS is a bit more tricky because of course you can have multiple disks uh, being part of the same Z pool. And you know, potentially you, you have a USB disk, which is part of that Z pool as well. Uh, so it's not trivial, but uh, hopefully somebody more skilled than I am with uh, ZFS will figure out some heuristic for the system to use, which will allow it to go ahead and boot once it's got the disk, disks it needs and not wait nine seconds for the US bus probing to time out. I mentioned before the PS2 keyboard reset initialization. Um, we spent about two and a half seconds doing this, uh, and this is mostly for compatibility with PS2 hardware from the 1980s. Um, we send reset signals to the keyboard controller, and then, then we wait 200 milliseconds before we try to read anything from it back. And my understanding is that this has to do with IBM PCs where the keyboard controller was actually in the keyboard and it would take up to 200 milliseconds for the voltage lines to stabilize between the keyboard and the motherboard. Uh, and so you, you wouldn't get sensible data back if you didn't wait long enough. Of course, nobody's running an IBM PC anymore. IBM PCs can't run modern FreeBSD anyway. Um, if you have something that looks like a PS2 keyboard, uh, it's not a PS2 keyboard. It's almost certainly uh, something running over USB, which then pretends to be a PS2 keyboard. So I'm pretty sure we don't need those 200 millisecond delays there. But uh, again, I don't want to start fiddling with this because I don't actually have any physical keyboards aside from the one 
built into my laptop. So I'm hoping somebody who has a bunch of hardware, ideally old hardware, uh, can dig into this driver and uh, maybe take out some of those delays just to speed up uh, all of the systems where we don't just disable the PS2 keyboard and mouse uh, in, in the bootloader. Um, I mentioned before the, the VM page initialization has been sped up significantly by about a factor of three uh, about four years ago. But if you've got a large amount of memory, it can still take a while. It's about four and a half milliseconds per gigabyte of RAM. Okay, you've got eight gigs of RAM, not a big deal, that's 36 milliseconds. If you've got eight terabytes of RAM, uh, that adds up to a lot. Um, now, when we first start running it in the kernel, we probably don't need eight terabytes of RAM to be initialized. We could probably make do with, say, 16 gigs of RAM and then create all of the VM page structures at a later time. Uh, ideally, at a later time, once we've already got all of our CPUs running, because then they can do it in parallel. Again, this is not something that I feel comfortable doing. I am not a VM expert, but hopefully somebody will take on this project at some point. Speaking of large systems, uh, we can bring up CPUs in parallel rather than one at once. Um, the Intel multiprocessing specification says you need to spend 10.4 milliseconds for each CPU that you launch. And right now we just launch them one at once. Well, if you've got 400 CPUs on your system, that's four seconds. Um, there are big systems out there and it would be nice if we can just spend 10 milliseconds instead of four seconds uh, launching all the CPUs. Again, not something that I really have the expertise to work on, but I know there are people out there who uh, are able to do this. And I know it has been done on other systems, uh, but not in FreeBSD. And finally, something I, I will be working on myself uh, is providing pre-patched EC2 images. Uh, right now, when you first launch a system on EC2, by default, it will run FreeBSD update and download security patches and install them before it enables SSH or generally runs any of your own code. This is you know, very useful for security purposes, but it does mean that if you're a while since the release, uh, it can take a while before the system is, is usable. Of course, you launched FreeBSD 13.1 right now, there aren't any patches yet, so that will be fast. But if you launch FreeBSD 13.1 next year, who knows how many patches it will need to download and uh, how, how slow it will make the boot process. So right now we only provide release images, but at some point in the future, I'd like to provide patched release images uh, in order to speed up this boot process. There's a lot of people who have contributed to this work, and I want to thank some of them. Uh, Andrew, Jin, uh, Warner, Mark, and uh, Tumas uh, have all contributed patches to this work, uh, some of the speed ups that I've mentioned in this talk. Uh, along this, is people have reviewed patches that I was putting into the tree. Um, uh, thanks also for uh, helping to document TSLog. We now have a man page for it, which you know, like many developers, I, I like writing code. I don't like writing documentation. Uh, and uh, I'd also like to thank all the sponsors that I have who've given me some time to, some paid hours to work on this. Um, of course, this is not my day job. My day job is, is running an online backup service. Um, but it's, as much as I enjoy working on FreeBSD, uh, it is very useful for me to, to have a few hours each month that I, I know I'm, I'm getting paid to work on it. Uh, and I'm not really taking time away from my, my day job in that sense. Now, this entire talk is, uh, of course, as of May 2022. If you're watching this uh, as part of the conference, of course, that's pretty up to date. If you're watching this on YouTube five years from now, hopefully we've, we've made more improvements since then. So uh, I encourage you, especially if you're watching on YouTube, uh, to go and, and look up the FreeBSD wiki page, uh, wiki.freebsd.org slash boot time, uh, where all the work I've described in this talk is mentioned there, uh, and then hopefully in the future you, you'll see more work there as well. And now uh, if everything is working as expected thanks to the magic of the internet uh, there will be some mechanism as part of the conference uh, for people to ask me questions. I don't know how this is going to work but uh, hopefully it has all been explained to you uh, and you can start asking me questions. Um, so the two questions that came in over IRC while I was talking, while 
my talk was being played. Um, the first question, uh, I mentioned instrumenting hammer time. Does that mean that this is AMD 64 only? Uh, no. Um, so hammer time is AMD 64 only. Um, I have, since then, I, I have instrumented the ARM 64 startup routines as well. Um, but in addition to that, if you're running on some weird system, I don't know, PowerPC, and you want to profile that, uh, you can you can still run all the TS log code. Uh, it won't have the very very beginning of the boot process in the the machine dependent uh, startup routines profiled, but you can still get the profiling from the rest of the system. Um, almost sorry, I should, I should add the bootloader because I had to write in code for getting the timestamps there. Um, the bootloader only has support for ARM sixty four and AMD sixty four profiling. But if you want to profile a bootloader on a different system, just let me know. And we, we just need to add code to tell how to get a timestamp. So that's easy to do. Um, second question was, uh, what's the difference between flame graphs and flame charts? Uh, I should have explained that. Um, I mentioned it in my, my talk four years ago, but uh, flame graphs are, uh, all of the entries in the graph are sorted uh, by name and, and aggregated together. Um, Flame charts, uh, everything is kept in chronological order. So um, the left side is the beginning of the boot process. The right side is the end of the boot process. Uh, question I see here, uh, are there any significant differences in the boot time or types of delays on ARM versus x86? Um, when I started this work, there were there was a lot of delays on x86 that didn't exist on ARM because x86 has been around for a long time. Uh, there's just a lot of legacy code in there, stuff like the, the two seconds of, of uh, timer calibration delays, where on ARM you just read a register that tells you what frequency you're running at. Um, at this point, it's pretty similar. Uh, the, the ARM systems do tend to boot slightly faster, at least the, the ones in, in EC2 I, I'm testing with. Um, I think that may be more uh, a matter of ARM systems don't have as many drivers looking at hardware, they, they have less hardware attached, less devices attached. So there's there's a bit less to do in terms of device probing, but generally it's it's pretty fast on both sides and the, the biggest differences are gone now. Okay, I'll just wait around a little bit in case any more questions come in, but I'm not seeing any more yet. Okay, I think I'm going to get out of the way for the next talk, which I should be starting in a couple minutes. Uh, if anybody has any other questions, um, send me an email, poke me on Twitter, find me on IRC, uh, all the usual ways, uh, happy to discuss this. Uh, and if anybody out there would like to uh, generate flame charts on their, on their systems, I would love to see more systems, more flame charts, see where time is going on different systems. Uh, again, generally generate the charts and send me to send them to me in any of the, the many ways out there that you can all find. Enjoy the rest of the day. <laughs>